be seated as we continue to give praise to the Lord. Thank you, Adair, all this morning. We want to sing one more song before Dr. Millwood comes. And if you'll look in your hymnal at hymn number 613, and you have the words also printed in your guide. But we're not going to sing that melody that's written right there. We're going to pick another old hymn and put these words to it. 
The main thing I want you to think about, though, is what are those words saying to us? Because we sing this in community. We sing it to one another. So would you stand with us? And then after this, we'll ask Dr. Millwood to come. We are travelers on a journey, fellow pilgrims on the road. We are here to help each other walk the mile and bear the load. I will hold the Christ light for you in the night time of your fear. I will hold my hands out to you, speak the peace you long to hear. Sister, let me be your servant, let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. Brother, let me be your servant. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. I will weep when you are weeping, when you laugh, I'll laugh with you. I will share your joy and sorrow till we've seen our journey through. When we sing to God in heaven, we shall such harmony born of all we've known together of Christ's love and agony Praise God from whom all blessings here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. What a wonderful time of worship, huh? Praise the Lord. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for being in chapel. I am really, really personally grateful that next week we'll have um, those of us on faculty opportunity to come dressed leisurely to chapel. I thought that the memo said... I'm sorry. <clears throat> I really am delighted to have the opportunity to share with you in chapel today and um, to worship the Lord together. I love uh, the city of New Orleans. Do you like New Orleans? Yeah. You're learning to like New Orleans? I think it's a great place to be and a great place to live. This is, uh, this is a town where um, we, we have the greatest zoo and aquarium in the world. And it's the only town where you can ride on a river paddle boat to get from one to the other. I mean, that's pretty cool. This is a great place. It really is. I was thinking about things that we have that other places don't have. That came to mind. We have the world's greatest restaurants. I mean, we enjoy eating. See those hands? Hear an amen? Oh, yes, that's right. That's a great place to eat. I mean, if you ate at every restaurant that we have every single day, one meal out a day for the rest of your life, by the time you got to the end of them, they would have closed a bunch and opened a bunch, and so you wouldn't have been to the end of them. It just keeps going and going and going. It's unbelievable. How many? And boy, do we have uh, beautiful trees. City Park, the world's largest collection 
of great uh, uh, oak trees. I mean, they're just beautiful. And if you are an environmentalist and enjoy hugging trees, you got to take chalk with you if you're going to hug a tree at City Park to mark your way around them. They're just gigantic, you know. They're huge. They really are. Uh, we are the home of, uh, I think, some of the world's greatest universities and theological institutions. Uh, we have the greatest drivers in the world. And you better be a great driver or you will not survive. You know, we have our AAA baseball team. I love baseball and the Zephyrs. Our AAA baseball team won the AAA World Series here a year or two ago. And if Houston will stay healthy, we'll have a chance to win it again. They keep taking all of our players. One of, the, one of the greatest sports facilities in the world, the Louisiana Superdome. My kids refer to it as that great underarm deodorant ball downtown. There's an image you'll never get out of your mind now, will you? And you drive by it. It's unbelievable. We have a, the nation's newest sports arena, the Mini Dome, or the Not So Super Dome, um, which has been nicknamed the Greenhouse, which is kind of ironic or interesting because inside it is ice, you know, and it's very rare you see a greenhouse with ice. That's where our AAA hockey team plays, or not really AAA, but it's that kind of thing uh, down there. And we have the most consistent franchise in NFL history. You can count on us. I mean, you really can. It's just a great, uh, great town. I've got to where I travel. People are always asking me, say, well, how's the weather in New Orleans? You know, what's the weather really like in New Orleans? And I finally come up with a description, I think, that makes it very clear to people. Um, have, you ever, have you ever taken a super hot shower in a very, very small restroom with no ventilation? And then when you step out, you know how the air is thick and everything, and you begin to dry off, and as fast as you can dry, sweat replaces the water from the shower. That's what we call May. (laughs) And then summer comes. It's a great place. It really is. As much as I love it, though, I've come this morning to share with you a word, I think, from God to me, and I hope to cast a vision for you and for our time in New Orleans. And I can't do that without the Holy Spirit, who is already present with us and in us and has been blessed by our worship time, but will you join me in going to Him just one more time? Our Father, you have a word for us today, and we want to make absolutely sure that we hear it. And so I pray, open our ears to hear, yes, but open our hearts to hear, to understand, and to apply. In Jesus' name, amen. Adele and I do love this town. We've been associated with this town for a number of years off and on now, and we absolutely love it. There are things we'd like to change. I would like to have more mountains than just Monkey Hill. I would like for those mountains to be snow-covered and for winter to last nine months out of the year. Personally, that's what I would enjoy. But by and large, we love it. And particularly, one of the things we like most about New Orleans is the opportunity to live here on our campus. This is really a, like an oasis kind of place. It's just un- unbelievable uh, to live here. We, we have uh, really only one heavy traffic time. That's from 7.30 to 8 in the morning, and it's just around the preschool center. <laughs> Other than that, there really is no traffic rush or jam or that kind of thing. It's a safe place to get out and walk around. It's a safe place to let your kids play. Uh, even sometimes unattended, and I, those are wonderful blessings. It's, it's, uh, it's something that a lot of folks don't have. It's a, it's a unique neighborhood. But then again, it, maybe in New Orleans it should be a neighborhood. I mean, this is a neighborhood town. Carrollton and, and West End and Uptown and, and the Garden District and Gentilly and Gentilly Woods, there are neighborhoods everywhere all over town. And so we kind of fit in the middle of that. In fact, uh, we're on the corner of two great neighborhoods, Gentilly Woods and Gentilly. And right here on this corner, and, and we have a nickname even, a neighborhood kind of nickname, in-house and I hate to say outhouse, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Off of the campus among uh, the folks that live in our neighborhood. They think of us as kind of a Mayberry-like place. You know, have you ever heard us refer to that? I mean, we, we kind of call ourselves that sometimes, Mayberry, and, and, and sometimes the neighbors will call us, uh, oh, that, yeah, they live over in Mayberry. It's, it's a different kind of place, which makes me think of a wonderful old television program that I absolutely love. So I thought uh, today, in order to, to hear our Bible story, uh, we might uh, go back to... Uh, uh, a dress rehearsal for an episode of a famous television program that, uh, well, it just never made it to prime time. So uh, will you enter with us there?
Right. Clear the set, everybody. Oh, okay, okay. Clear the set. Actors, take your places, please. Come on, let's get this thing going. Cue the tape up there. Three, two, one. Do not 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 do well, I might live out on the highway and no one might live next to me, but I know almost everybody in town. Gomer has a point, Andy. Hmm. Now, Floyd, <laughs> there you go, picking sides. You know very well that neighbors li that live next door to you. A and, well, no one lives out there, so, so Gomer doesn't have a neighbor. I only ever once in a while, well, Goober will stop by and check on his cousin. Well, Barney has a point, too, Andy. So I do have neighbors. Do not. Do 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 not. Do 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 not. Ho 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 ho. Hold it down, fellas. You ought not be arguing about neighbors. Well, Andy has a point too. <laughs> now, Andy, there is a right and a wrong answer here, and I'm right. That's right, that's right. There's a right and a wrong answer, and my neighbor, Barney, is wrong. I am not your neighbor. Or two. Or not. Or two. Or not. Oh, or oh, or oh, hold it down, fellas. Hold it down. There's, uh, there's got to be some way that we can settle this. If you ask me, nobody, nobody asks you. you. Barney and Gomer have two different definitions of the word neighbor. Well, now, Floyd, I think you've got a point here. Well, Andy, why don't you tell us what a neighbor is? Because Andy's the sheriff, and he's got better things to do than sit around I, and act like a human being. I, 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 I think that's right, Barn. I probably have other things I could be doing, but, you know, instead of acting like a human dictionary, I, I think maybe I'd rather um, maybe tell you all a story. Don't you? I love stories. Me too. <laughs> well, let me tell you a story about a fella who was driving from Mount Pilot over to Rob. Well, what's his name, Andy? It, it's just a fella, Floyd. It's just a story about a fella. Well, have, I, have I ever cut his hair? No, 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 <clears throat> Floyd. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's just a story. It's, his name's not important to the story. I can tell a lot about a fella from the way I cut his hair. Lloyd, zip it, zip it, zip it in the bud. Now, Barney. Settle down. Settle down. Floyd, it's all right. It's all right. It really is. Uh, it's just a story about a fellow who was driving from Mount Pilot to, to Raleigh. He's all just... right, Andy. But in the barbering business, knowing folks' names is important. Okay, Floyd, but this is not a story about barbering, okay? <laughs> all right, now, this, you see, there's this fellow who, who was driving from Mount Pilot over to Raleigh, and his car breaks down. What kind of car was it, Andy? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what kind of car it was, Gomer. Well, if you tell me what kind of car it was, then tell you what was wrong with it. It's just a story, Gomer. It's just a story. Well, it must be important to the story because he's driving a car and the car uh, broke uh, down. Uh, 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 all right, all right, all right, Gomer. It um, is a Ford. He's driving a Ford. It's a carburetor. What? <laughs> carburetor. He's driving a Ford. It was a carburetor. Carburetors go battle in Ford's lot. Okay, Gomer. Uh, this fellow was driving a Ford, had a carburetor that went bad. And, and so he, he just pulled right on over uh, to the... Andy. What, Floyd? You told Gomer what kind of car he was driving. <laughs> but you wouldn't tell me what his name was. It seems to me like a fella's name ought to be more important than what kind of car he drives. All right, Floyd. Uh, 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 let's just... Let, uh, Chuck. Let's call him Chuck. His name is Chuck, okay? Chuck. Mm -hmm. He has a nice short haircut. Yes, Floyd, that's right. <laughs> Chuck with a nice short haircut, Floyd, with a drive in his car, that's a Ford car, Gomer, along on the road between Mount Pilot and Raleigh when the car broke down because the carburetor went bad, all right? And so he just pulls right over to the side of the road. Ain't it? Is this absolutely necessary? Hush up, Barney. All right, Chuck is driving his Ford, and he's left Mount Pilot, and he's not flying over to Raleigh now. 
and his car's broke down, so he pulls over to the side of the road. Randy, you know what he ought to do? No, Gomer, what should he do? He ought to call Goober and have Goober come out and throw him back into town. It, yeah, yeah, that's what he ought to do. But see, he, he doesn't have a phone, so he's just stuck there on the side of the road. Now, he's going to... Hey, Andy. What is it, Gomer? Goober says, hey. <laughs> hey to Goober. Now, Chuck is broke down on the side of the road on his way from Mount Pilot to Raleigh because his carburetor's gone bad on his Ford automobile. So he gets out of the car just like he's supposed to, and he raises the hood, lets folks know there's something wrong. Suddenly, a state trooper comes driving by. A state trooper? Yeah, Barn, that's right. A state trooper comes driving by. A North Carolina state trooper? It, yeah, yeah, that's right. Is a North Carolina state trooper comes driving by. Did, did, did he have his have uniform on, Andy? Oh, my, my, my. Had that purdy blue shirt. Those sharp creased britches. And, and, and did, he, did he have his hat on? Oh, yeah, Barn. Had that really fancy hat on like they wear in the car. You know, one of these days, I'm going to be working for the state. And I'm going to be a state trooper. Okay, Barn. Now, <laughs> state trooper comes driving by, and, 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 and oh, ooh, he'll he'll help him. Well, yeah, boy, that's exactly what he ought to do. He ought to stop and help him. That's because he's a state trooper. That's right. Uh, but you know what? That, that state trooper who was in his hat and his uh, pretty clothes and everything, he just kept on going. Now, Andy, that's just not right. There is no way that a North Carolina state trooper in his uniform, patrol car, hat, the whole thing, would just drive on by and leave somebody stranded at the side of the road. Martin, that's the point of the story. <laughs> you see, he should have stopped, but he didn't. He just kept on going. There is no way I could understand why anyone would do something like that. It, it, it is because he had important business to do up to the governor's office. Well, that's a reason. Not a good one, but it's a reason. Okay, so the state trooper, he just drives on by and he leaves Chuck stranded there on the side of the road with his Ford automobile that's hood up because the carburetor's gone bad and everything. And then suddenly, coming around the curve from a distance, you look out yonder, there comes a tow truck. It's Goober. No, no, it's not Goober, Gomer. It's, it's, it's somebody else in another tow truck. Hey, Andy, you think it's one of those big tow truck companies from Raleigh? Yeah, yeah, that's just one of those great big tow truck companies from over in Raleigh. They have Mack trucks, big Mack trucks. That's right, that's right, Gomer. They got great old big Mack trucks. Now, Chuck's sitting there on the side of the road, his Ford automobile hood up, his carburetor's on bad, broke down the side of the road now, and, he, and that guy comes to driving by, and you know what he does? He blows his horn, and he waves, and he, he commits to hollering out the window, and he says... I got to make a run over to Mount Pilot, but if you'll just stay here, I'll come back and help you directly. Well, Andy, he needs his help right then. Uh, that's good, Gomer. That's right. Chuck's broke down right now. And he needs the help right now. Well, but, Goober would never do that. No, no, he wouldn't do that, you know. But but it's what happened anyway. It's what, it's what he did. Now, Andy, you're telling us that a North Carolina state trooper in his patrol car right. has passed. That's right. And now one of those big tow truck companies from Raleigh has now passed him by. That's exactly right, Barn. That's exactly what happened. Well, now, those fellas just don't seem very neighborly at all. They don't seem neighborly, not one iota. But then, coming down the road is a little old bitty car with New York license plate. New York? New York? A Yankee. That's right, boy. He's a Yankee. <laughs> and he's a... He's driving through North Carolina, and he happened to be on the same road old Chuck was on, and he's on his way to vacation. A Yankee. Yeah, that's right. He's from New York. New York? New York. That's right. He's a Yankee from New York who was driving through. And he came up on old Chuck sitting there on the side of the road with his hood up on his Ford automobile because the carburetor's gone bad, and he pulled... Oh, well, Randy, what you gonna do? He don't know nothing about no Ford automobile. Well, now you're absolutely right, Gomer. He didn't know a thing about cars, but you know what he knows about? No, why? People. He sees Chuck sitting there on the side of the road in his car, and he sees that he's in trouble, so he just pulls right on over. And he, he asks Chuck, he says to him, he says, uh, how you doing? And Chuck says, well, I'm not doing so well. I'm sitting here on the side of the road with my Ford automobile hood up because carburetor's gone bad. People have been passing me all day long. had nobody stopped to help. And then, that neighborly Yankee, he says to Chuck, well, let me give you a ride on into town. 
A Yankee. That's right, Floyd. Unbelievable. I know. A Yankee. Chuck gets in the car with him, and, and he rides on into town, and they stop on the way over to the Rosebud Diner. Where's that? Oh, you, you know, Barn. It's that little out of the way diner you took that gal from Mount Pilot. Uh, Andy, it's just a story. Just a story. Just help the story. Uh, all right, Barn. <laughs> so, so they stop at the Rosebud Diner, and, and this fellow from New York, he buys him and Chuck uh, the Blue Plate Special. Well, that sounds just like a fellow with a nice, clean haircut. Yeah, and a nice guy he was, too, Floyd. I tell you, he buys Chuck that warm lunch, and then he takes him over to the tow truck company. And he tells Chuck, he says, you just rest here in the car a minute. I'm going to go in and check and see if they got a truck that can help you out. After a little while, he comes back out and he says, uh, they got a truck and it's ready to go. And he shakes hand with him, get in his car, and he just drives off that New York license plate, driving down the road. A Yankee. Yeah, that's right. Well, now, Chuck walks into the tow truck company and he says to the guy at the counter, he says, uh, so you guys have a truck that can help me out? My car's broke down between here and Mount Pilot. You know, I, I think it's the carburetor. And the fellow at the counter kind of chuckles to himself and he says, I, I, you're, not, you're the second guy in the last five minutes to come in here with a car broke down between here and Mount Pilot and carburetor trouble. And old Chuck says to him, he says, no, no, that other fellow, he's just talking about my car. And then the guy at the counter says, talking about your car? Why, he did more than talk about your car. He done already paid for the tow and for the work on the carburetor. Now, fellas, let me ask you a question. Who was Chuck's neighbor? Well, it wasn't the state patrolman. That's right. It wasn't him, but he... He, 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 he had business. He did. He had business. He, he was a busy, busy man. So busy, he just couldn't, couldn't be a neighbor. But um, he wasn't a neighbor. That's right. Well, it wasn't the tow truck driver from that big tow truck company in Raleigh because he just passed him on by. That's right. He just drove on by, waved, yelled, acted real friendly, but just drove on by. Didn't help. The Yankee. <laughs> That's right, Floyd. It was the Yankee who was the helper to Chuck. Now, Andy. Yeah, Barn? With an interesting story. Thank you very much. But what does it have to do with whether Gomer has a neighbor or not? I've got lots of neighbors. Do not. Do soon. Do not. Do soon. Do not. Do not. Do not. Do not. Do not. Hold it. Hold it. Do not. 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 Less with who lives next door to you. Exactly, Floyd. A neighbor's not the person who lives next door to you. It's the person who's right there with you right now. And every day, every one of us has got to make a decision as to whether we're going to be neighborly or not. Okay, guys, that's a wrap. All right. Well, I hope you recognize the story from the Bible because that's where we got it from, even though uh, some of the names were changed to protect the innocent. I really want to thank Stace and Jeff and Corey and Jessica and Noah and everybody else who helped us uh, with uh, the scripting and with uh, all, all of the work for this. I really appreciate it. Jesus was uh, on one particular occasion being accosted by leaders in the established church, which did happen from time to time to him, you know that, in an effort to trick him up. Somebody, a lawyer nonetheless, stood up and said, uh, there are, I believe, ten commandments and ten thousand commentaries about them. <laughs> Could you tell us, teacher, which one of the ten would be number one, the greatest, the most important? And his response was what we have come to call the great commandment. That's all right, I'll tell you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew and Mark stop there. They don't tell us the rest of the story. Luke, maybe because he was a Gentile and was quite interested in what happened next, shared the story. He said, the lawyer, not wanting to be outdone by the teacher, said, no, I, I, excuse me, teacher, that's very attractive. Thank you for sharing that lovely baby boomer kind of answer. But just who is a my neighbor? 
And to that, Jesus told the story that we have come to call the Good Samaritan, a version of which, thanks to the Mayberry folks, we were able to uh, share with you this morning. As a story we're very familiar with, and we like to dissect it and look at the parts and who was playing what role and why did they pass by and all those other things. But I think in the context, the thing to remember is there was a simple question, who's my neighbor, and a simple answer. And the answer was, it's that guy to whom you can show mercy right now. And the command that came after it, so go out and show mercy. Be merciful, which is the last thing that lawyer was being at the moment. Treat people different than they deserve, better than they deserve. That was really the simple answer to the simple question. I've been associated with New Orleans Seminary for, in some way or another for almost 20 years. Adele and I have been often on this campus as staff and part-time student help and student and alumni where we get to send in money. And just a hint for those of you who graduate in the future. Um, and, and now faculty, and I'm grateful for all of that. But in the almost 20 years, I bet I've heard a thousand sermons that said, you know what you need to do, New Orleans. This seminary's got to figure out a way to get out of those gates and get into this neighborhood and make a difference. And for every one of those sermons, I've heard a thousand excuses about how come we can't do that. Why we're so different, or, or why some folks are scared, or why some of us talk with a, a southern twang instead of a New Orleans brogue, or all these other things. It seems like for every message there is some kind of an excuse. And I'm just going to be a very open and honest with you this morning if I can. It has been a great tension in my life. It really has. The tension of knowing what I ought to do, what I really should do, and figuring out how to do it. How, how do I spend enough time to make enough friendship how do I get out in this community and make some difference other than just an economic difference by buying my groceries here or those kinds of things? It's a, it's a really frustrating thing to me. It's a pilgrimage I've been on for a long time. And in the fall, I was praying just about the time that the invitation came to speak in chapel about this matter, and the Lord took me to this passage of Scripture. And He said to me, Stop sitting in your office or in your home, spinning your wheels, trying to figure out how to get out into this community. Because he said, I will bring the community to you. I said, Lord, don't you know, we've got campus security. <laughs> and he began to show me how he's bringing folks to me. Did you know that we have delivery people on campus almost every day of the week? Folks from Coca-Cola, folks from snack food companies, folks from Office Depot. There are folks on this campus delivering stuff almost every single day of the week. And some of them are the same people who come week after week after week. And do you know what? I sometimes act like that big tow truck driver from Mount Pilot, a Raleigh, and I just throw my hand up at him, and I don't even know their name. But not only do we have the big corporate deliveries, I'm trying not to mess up the floor, we have personal deliveries. Y'all recognize these kinds of stickers? That's the kind of stuff that comes on UPS and FedEx and RPS. Have you ever seen them driving up and down the road? You don't want to be too close to the road when they come by, you know. At 25, is just kind of vague at that point. I read in the paper that uh, FedEx and UPS are going to merge. New company, fed up. <laughs> so. They come up to the door and talk to you. I, and it's the same delivery people from a lot of the companies, especially from UPS, be very similar delivery people. I, I don't know the names. Now let's see what's been delivered today. Ah, ah, yes. Uh, let's get it out of here. Let's see. This is a uh, mail. Right there. This is about a half a day's worth of junk mail. <laughs> the rest of it I couldn't get in the box. 
you know what the Lord said to me? He said, Millwood, you don't even know the mail carrier by name. We have about the same one who comes up and down our street one, uh, five days a week and then an, an extra that comes in. And there's a couple on campus plus a couple that come up to the coffee shop area for the post office. And uh, to me, they're just folks passing through. But to him, they're people for whom he gave his son. I don't know who they are. I don't know what to call them. I don't, especially don't know what to call the females that deliver mail. Is that a, is that a female mail person? Or I, it's, it's all very confusing in my head, you know. But uh, we, have, uh, we have mail deliverers who come on campus all the time, which is uh, just wonderful. Now, here's, here's one of my favorites. This here is, of course, a briefcase, which I'm not going to open so you can see the inside of it, but I want you to pretend that it's a briefcase that is owned by a Xerox repair person. If you've ever needed a copy machine around here, you'll, you'll be able to find the one that this person is going to. There are three or four of them come on campus all the time. I mean, every week it seems like, and sometimes twice a week, they'll be there. And do you know what my reaction is when I walk into the room and see the repair person sitting there with their briefcase open and the, co- and, and the copy machine ripped to pieces? My reaction is, Man, I got a class in ten minutes. I got to walk to the other side of campus to find a copy machine. And yet God said, hey, I'm bringing the town to you. Have you have you seen the new sunroof we put in the uh, bunion building? <laughs> I like it myself. I really do. And uh, you, you know how the pavement was buckling at the parking places back here? So we've replaced it with cement, which, of course, over time will buckle also because we're in New Orleans and we build on water. But, but at least it's... Uh, you know, there are construction people on our campus constantly. And sometimes they stop by the, the, the cafeteria and pick up a bite to eat. And the Lord said, Millwood, I'm bringing them right there to you. I'm bringing the city of New Orleans to you. Well, I said, Lord, anything else? And he said, well, if you can't, a beat a man can. <laughs> Water delivery guys coming on campus, Abita Springs and Kent Wood, in and out they come every day, and they just park their trucks right in front of my house and get in the way sometimes, you know. And yet they're people that God loves so much that he sent his son to die for. Let's see. Oh yeah, yeah. This is this is uh, this is a prized possession for many of you. A coffee cup. Um, you know, Cafe New Orleans is open to the public, and we have people live in our community that come on campus just to get a cup of coffee and sit down. And I look at them and say, uh, you know, could you guys move over yonder to sit and talk? I've got to meet with some students right now. I consider it another part of my office, and God considers it his mission field. Be very careful. You know, you're supposed to hold the back of their heads just like this. Little baby. I'm being careful. You tell Shelby I'm being careful. You know what I learned this past week? Seventy-five percent of the children in our preschool center right now are from the community. I confess to you, I don't have any children in the preschool center. I'm way past that. Remember that, sweetheart. uh, But some of you do. When you walk in and out of the doors over there and you talk to the teachers who are largely made up of spouses of our students and you talk to the students who are in class with you, are you getting to know the parents of the kids who aren't part of us? The Lord um, spoke to me. And he said, I want to cast a vision for New Orleans Seminary. I want to say to the seminary family, quit 
quit playing mental games trying to figure out how to get out into the community and instead be neighbors to the community I'm bringing to you. He said that to me. Since it's the only word I had from him, I figured I better deliver it to you too. He said they're not inconveniences. They're not city services. They're people who I love so much that I, I gave my son for. He said, don't be a state trooper who's got important business to do. And don't be a tow truck driver who's just right friendly but waves and drives on by. He said, um, be a neighbor. Get to know them. Treat them different. Some have said through the years in interpreting our mission that uh, wouldn't it be tragic if the seminary sits on this corner for 50 years and never makes a significant difference in this community? And it would be. But wouldn't it be more tragic to sit around on this community claiming that we have a virus which is contagious? called the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And to have people who walk amongst us every single day and never catch it? Imagine one Xerox copy repair person who we all get to know, we all get to love, we all get to influence and join in that process that ends in conversion. That one single repair person Influences his or her office. Influences his or her family. And through their family influences their school and other places of vocation. That one single repair person carries the briefcase of tools and the gospel of Jesus Christ from business to business to business in our city. Copy machine to copy machine. Administrator and secretary to administrator and secretary. And they carry the gospel that they catch from him or her to their families and to their circles of influence. We have not yet begun to capture the dream. And Jesus said, Millwood, be a neighbor. Show mercy. Decide to treat people neighborly. So my word from God that I share with you is let's go and be neighbors. Father, when Jesus told the story the first time, it hit home. When He told the story to me this last fall, it hit home. Please, let it hit home again. In Jesus' name I pray.